17 SDGs are the biggest strategy and call to action in the whole world. And these are expressed through the commitments, as everybody knows, I think, from uh, 193 countries around the world are committed to the Sustainable Development Goals back in 2015, and they've begun being implemented in 2016. Orientating what we do towards this global action plan is key for uh, any responsible university, in our view, in terms of how they can make, make a positive contribution to the world. And we work towards the Sustainable Development Goals in four main ways as a university, through our research, through our students, through our public engagement activity, and through our own university operations. And we measure and report our progress against the SDGs um, each year. We're also pleased that in the last three years, we have be been ranked as the top institution in the UK for our performance against the Sustainable Development Goals. And, and actually at the moment, we are the number one university in the world. So from 1,200 universities globally, Manchester University is currently number one, which we're really pleased about. We, um, we know that the 17 SDGs key to all, achieving all of those are partnerships. And there's a special SDG number 17. Those of you that are SDG geeks will know this. SDG 17 is called Partnerships for the Goals. And that's the focus of today's case studies. We are going to be talking about the importance of partnerships for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And we're going to do this through telling three stories today. The first story will be one of a regional partnership uh, addressing childhood wellbeing. And that's a regional partnership that the university has. The second story you're going to tell is one of a national partnership to address the productivity challenge in the UK. And the third story we want to tell is of an international partnership we have with the Association of Commonwealth Universities. And we'll be closing that off then with an invitation to you all, if you're an external partner watching this, to get involved with the work of the university through our university living lab. So we're going to do three lightning talks of about five, up to five minutes, a quick conversation of a regional, a national and an international partnership. So without further ado, let me start off then by introducing our first speaker today, and that's <coughs> Professor Neil Humphreys. Neil studied psychology at the University of Liverpool and he has a PhD in education. He's lectured in psychology of education at the University of Manchester since 2002. So he's been here almost as long as I have. He became a senior lecturer in 2007 and he was promoted to professor of psychology of education in 2010. I remember when this happened because Neil was one of the youngest people I can think of who became a professor at the university at that time. He was research director in education between 2013 and 2016. And he was also the head of Manchester Institute of Education from 2016 to 2019. His research focuses on what we mean by mental health, why mental health matters, what, men what mental health um, means in terms of children and young people, and he's also the lead academic on the, the Be Well programme. So Neil, what we want you to do first of all then is just spend five minutes telling us what Be Well is and why it relates to the Sustainable Development Goals, please. Over to you, Neil. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Julian. And um... Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everybody watching, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so um, the Be Well project is, so it's a new program. It's led by the University of Manchester in partnership with the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the Anna Freud National Centre for Children and Families. And in a nutshell, um, Be Well is about combining academic expertise with youth-led change to make the well-being of young people everybody's business. So... Uh, Be Well is designed by young people uh, in, in collaboration with young people. So everything that I will talk you through in the next five minutes uh, has been uh, developed through a co-production process. Uh, we've consulted with probably somewhere in the region now of around somewhere between 150 to 200 young people across the city region of Greater Manchester about the design of the Be Well project and, and its aims and so on, as well as academic experts. Um, the, the, the basics of the programme are, uh, it's about using, um, you, collecting and using uh, large scale, high quality data about young people's wellbeing and the things that drive their wellbeing as a stimulus for delivering positive change in schools and communities. So in the first kind of, uh, in the first kind of um, 
stage of the BWELL programme, which is over the next three years, we hope it will be extended for longer. Uh, but in the first stage of BWELL, we're surveying the young people uh, in secondary schools across Greater Manchester once a year for three years uh, on um, different aspects of their well-being and different aspects of the things that drive their well-being, pulling that data together, uh, presenting it back to schools and presenting it back to communities and, and partner organisations uh, as a stimulus then and as a means to uh, generate a conversation about how we can move things forward in terms of supporting young people uh, to improve well-being and improve the factors that influence their well-being. Um, we're funded uh, by a range of different partners, including the University of Manchester, but also uh, the Oglesby Charitable Trust, the National Lottery Community Fund, Children in Need and a range of other uh, funders. We have around uh, getting close to 100 partner organisations that have joined our uh, wellbeing coalition. So these include uh, service delivery partners, so organisations like 42nd Street and Place to Be, who provide support for young people's mental health and wellbeing. Uh, business partners like the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, the Timpson Group, uh, our funders, and then also research partners, so academic experts, including the Institute for Health Equity at UCL and the Education Policy Institute. So, as I mentioned, we're, we're the, the the kind of backbone of the Be Well project is uh, the the delivery of a, a very large scale uh, survey. So, we designed the survey with young people, as I mentioned, uh, starting with a question about what does well being mean to you and what makes you thrive, and then we've used the feedback young people have provided us to pull together uh, a survey battery using a range of existing measures that spans. Uh, things like the extent to which young people feel meaning and purpose and control in their lives, uh, their emotional experiences, how they understand themselves and their well-being, and then a range of drivers. So young people told us that their health and routines are important, things like physical health and nutrition, um, their hobbies and entertainment, how they spend their free time, their relationships with other people, their experiences in school, their local environment, uh, and how they feel about their future. And so we we built this survey with young people and then we've delivered it in Greater Manchester for the first time uh, just before Christmas in, in the autumn term in schools in Greater Manchester uh, to somewhere around 160 secondary schools, uh, which is most of the secondary schools uh, in Greater Manchester. Uh, and we had data from just shy of uh, 40,000 people. It's about 38,000 and something. I can't remember the exact figure off the top of my head. But getting close to 40,000 young people provided data. So one of the key things that we're very happy about in the, the first instance is having provided a voice for uh, so many young people across the city region. So that data is really useful for academics like me. It means that I can spend the next 20 years writing papers about you know, issues to do with inequalities and what influences well-being and all the rest of it. But what we're really passionate about in BeWell is actually taking data and using it to inform action on the ground. So we feed the data back to schools, communities and those partner organisations in two ways. We have a, a data dashboard uh, that all of our schools can access uh, that shows them uh, the aggregated data for their school and different groups of young people in their school um, that they can kind of interact with and look, look for patterns and trends and so on. But then we also provide uh, a neighbourhood data dashboard that uses the 67 neighbourhoods across Greater Manchester as its kind of focal point. And that helps our partner organisations identify uh, the different areas within Greater Manchester where there is greater or lesser need or, or areas of strength and difficulty as a basis for then focusing the, you know, what, what are always going to be stretched resources in the areas of Greater Manchester where there is greatest need. So we, we provide these interactive data dashboards, which then our partner organisations work with and our schools work with, and they're supported by the Anna Freud National Centre for Children and Families to interpret that data. So we don't just push the data out and say, there you go, do something about it. We have a support system where the Anna Freud Centre colleagues will work with, for example, schools to interpret the data and help them to think about, well, what does this mean in our context? And what does it mean in terms of the things that we might do in the future to try and support young people's well-being or the things that drive their well-being uh, more effectively? So that's it in a real kind of quick nutshell. Uh, I, I've, I've Julian asked to, for me to flag the, the SDGs that this relates to. The, the, the key obvious ones for me are about quality education. So schools in Greater Manchester are already extremely committed to providing a, a high quality education. 
for all children and young people. And Be Well is a way of strengthening their resolve in that respect, and particularly in focusing around how a good quality education can impact on the second SDG, which I wanted to, to make reference to, which was health and well-being. So the whole project is about uh, health and well-being, but particularly about how we can use uh, school and educational experiences, but also experiences in the community and in families and, and in all of the different arenas within which children live their lives uh, to support better health and well-being. Because for us, it's one of the most important things that we can do in terms of setting young people up for a meaningful, productive and fulfilling life. Thank you very much, Neil. You covered a huge amount of ground down. It's such an exciting project for us at the university so I wanted to, to, to zoom in on because this is about partnerships then and I just wondered if you could say something about the special role of the university as a partner because all 17 of the SDGs will need higher education if we're to, to, to try and meet those goals in the world so imagine this project without a university the counterfactual if you like yeah. what would it be lacking why is a university so important to a mental health and well-being project in a city region or in a nation well, I, I think, you know, to, to put it bluntly, if, if if we didn't have the university as the kind of the, the, the kind of um, the central component in this kind of partnership approach, we wouldn't have a project. So it's been the university's kind of contribution has been really important in, in terms of, first of all, getting the project off the ground. So we were able to. Uh, make use of the university's commitment to uh, this work to enable us to attract uh, other partners and other funders. So it's, it basically it got the ball rolling, but it's also provided an incredible research infrastructure um, that we, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do what we've just done, which is one of the largest um, well-being surveys of its kind, certainly in this country, but probably actually anywhere in the world. We certainly wouldn't have been able to do that without the significant research infrastructure that the university uh, is able to provide uh, and, and the relationship building. So just being able to use the university's reputation and particularly its commitment to kind of social responsibility and so on has been really influential in us being able to build partnerships with you know some really quite powerful organizations whether they're local organizations that have real strong reach within greater manchester but also national and international organizations who have partnered with us in different ways so it's been absolutely central yeah i was going to ask about that next section it's a nice segue in because the, the other question then is okay imagine this project with just the university involved without some of the partners what would be the difference what are the partners brought to this initiative well it, it's for me it's all about the the relationships that the partnerships provide and, and the way in which those relationships enable things to happen that otherwise would be very difficult or, or impossible so a good example is the partnership that we have with the combined authority with gmca um a, a good chunk of the project in terms of the, the, the staff and the personnel are actually based in the combined authority. So it's not just, you know, the university has their team and then we have a link. You know, our project manager is based there. Uh, we have various other members of staff based there. But the relationships then that feed out into the local authorities, uh, the 10 local authorities of, of the um, Great Manchester City region, uh, and their relationships then with the, the various schools uh, within those local authorities and the different uh, charitable and voluntary and community sector organisations, all of that has been made possible through uh, this brilliant partnership with GMCA. They, they can open doors for us to make things happen in a way that the university acting on its own wouldn't be able to do, but it's mutual as well. So, you know, there's a reciprocal relationship in the way that we're able to provide them with access to data and insights from the research that you know that they wouldn't be able to achieve on their own so it's very much a mutually uh, beneficial partnership and the same goes for the other main partner which is the Anna national center Anna Freud national center for children and families they have uh, significant expertise uh, in helping uh, schools and other organizations work with uh, the kind of data uh, the aggregated data that we're providing uh, to think about um, adopting and, and improving and, and kind of uh, working with evidence-informed approaches to supporting well-being, so it's it's very much a kind of symbiotic relationship between those three main partners. Any one of us on our own wouldn't be able to do. You know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts in, in this project. Very much so. Thanks for that, Neil. And I think that's why you're on the call today because we think it's a great partnership um, in the university between uh, a third sector organisation, uh, you know, the, the, the local 
uh, government in, in the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the local authorities and the university. It's, it's a really great example of that, as you've illustrated. I just wanted to finish off then by asking if, if this was an initiative uh, succeeded in the way you hope it would, if it progressed in the way you would like it to, what, what, what would people be saying about it in five years' time? Where would we be looking back in five years' time if everything went really well from your perspective? Um, okay, well, in brief, I think if, if what does success look like? I think in five years' time, I would hope that we we're, that, that Be Well is still happening. You know, so initially we've got funding for three years, but obviously we're looking to extend that. So Be Well would still be happening. But more importantly, I think, you know, people would say that we've made a difference in the city region. Um, you know, our goal is to, we, we, we talk about kind of pivoting the system to well-being. So, you know, a lot of the focus of um, those that work with and for young people naturally kind of tends to gravitate for various reasons towards educational outcomes, which of course are important, but we want to pivot the system so that uh, well-being and well-being related experiences and outcomes are given kind of you know parity of esteem so we pivot the system to well-being uh, and that we're making a difference in terms of being able to see how things have changed on the ground so that we're able to say these things are now happening to support young people's well-being across the city region um that we that you know that we can trace back to the things that we've done earlier in the in the project with with be well so the data that we provided has meant that you know this community in you know in say moss side or this community somewhere in oldham uh, are accessing uh, support and resources that have been made available directly because of the data that we've gathered and then the final thing that i think i would say in terms of five years time is we would certainly hope to be influencing the conversation beyond the city region so this is Greater Manchester is essentially a test case for us for what might a, a system like this look like nationally. You know, so Greater Manchester's got some fantastic advantages in in terms of the way that you know the, the way that local government in Greater Manchester think, and in terms of local devolution of health services and so on. Um, and we want to use it to, to be able to show, you know, the government and to show other parts of the country this is what can be done if we make an investment of this kind in young people's well-being. And indeed already even though we're in our very early phases we're starting to see some evidence of that so we're having conversations with other local authorities around the country conversations with the department for education and so on so the the signs are very positive in that respect but those would be kind of three key things that would be uh i'd hope we would be talking about in five years time neil thank you very much that's an excellent overview and um to start with something so inspirational i'm really Delighted you could join us today. So that's a regional partnership then. What we're going to do now, and if you want to find out more, by the way, about the Be Well initiative, there'll be a link in the description of the video about this. And we do encourage you to read more about it. What we'd like to do now is introduce our next partnership, which is a, a national partnership. So we're zooming out from Greater Manchester to a UK partnership. And this is our National Productivity Institute, based here at the University of Manchester, but very much as a national partnership. And the person we're going to get to talk about this is Nicola Pike. Now, Nicola works as the Engagement and Operations Director at the Productivity Institute. We're delighted to have you here today, Nicola. Um, Nicola has more than 20 years experience in business to business communications, in marketing and engagement. And she's worked in a variety of sectors, not just in higher education. So she's worked in financial services and in professional services. And through her career, she's had a particular focus on partnership making, which makes today all the more apt with this focus on partnerships of the university. So Nicola, I, I'm interested, first of all, if you can do similar to what Neil did, give us about a five minute or maybe even less uh, overview of the Productivity Institute, telling us a bit more, what, what is productivity? What's the productivity Institute. And importantly for us, how does it relate to the Sustainable Development Goals? So over to you, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, delighted to be here today. So let's start with what productivity is and why it matters. Um, so that there's a famous uh, phrase from the Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman that says productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. And I think you'll find hopefully while I talk um, that there's such a connection to most of those sustainable development goals. Um, and it matters because it reflects the degree with what we're all producing uh, and, and becoming more efficient. Um, and if productivity rises, we can pay workers more for their efforts without risking an inflationary spiral. It, it affects the standard of living. Um, and it, it, it's 
absolutely underpins most of those SDGs. Our mission as a productivity institute is to lay the foundations for an era of sustained and inclusive productivity um, and help policymakers and business leaders. So this is a truly in partnership. This is about informing policymakers and business leaders across the UK, but also hopefully across the world, um, how to help them understand how to improve productivity and to raise those living standards. So already, hopefully, you can see that there's a real connection there with the four out of the five Ps um, from the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, in terms of that universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, um, and ensure that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. So it's really about prosperity for all. Um, so how are we doing that? So we, as you said, we're a national institute with our headquarters in Manchester. Um, so we have throughout the UK partners in the three devolved nations. Um, so Glasgow in Scotland, Cardiff in Wales, Queen's University in Belfast, and others throughout England as well. So we have Cambridge, King's College in London, Warwick and Sheffield. And together we've got an industry interdisciplinary group of academic researchers, um, over 40 co-investigators, if you like, working with our managing director, Bart Van Ark, and our research director, Tony Venables, um, to understand what are the triggers, what, what, what are the problems, identify those problems, and how can they be solved, and how can we improve productivity? And that's looking at it from lots of different perspectives. So there's the firm level, um, investing in people, ideas, and organizations. So um, very economist term, human capital, so that's, that's the people in a business and making sure they have the skills. We just heard about well-being from a child's perspective, but well-being is really important from an employee perspective, has a major impact on productivity. So we look at things like that as well. Um, knowledge capital, um, knowledge intensive economy and, and inventing innovation comes from knowledge capital. So that's really important as well. And then there's the organizational capital, how are businesses set up, how are they optimized for productivity. Um, in the UK, uh, when we measure productivity, there are variances between regions. We typically see that London in the South is far more productive than other parts of the UK. Um, and we want to spread that prosperity. So geography in place is a really important part of what we're trying to do as well, to spread that wealth across the UK and spread that prosperity and productivity. Um, we uh, obviously, there's lots of policy levers that impact on productivity. So the macroeconomic um, and policy element is really important. And we have a research team looking at that and the institutions and governments that underpin that um, are really important as well. You know, and, and not just, um, you know, our Westminster model, but the, the regional devolved governments as well, uh, and, and looking at um, with different models um, support better productivity. Um, we obviously need to measure this. And um, as, as the world has changed from this um, industrial revolution approach, you know, where it's things coming out of a factory where it, to this knowledge economy, the digital economy, do we need to measure things in a different way? So that's something we're looking at as well. And then let's focus on the future. And this is the bit where I think there is a very, very distinct link with a lot of the SDGs and that's social, environmental and technological transitions. How do we get to net zero in a productive way? Because there could be unintended consequences of um, putting in place policies that um, ask companies and governments uh, to adopt net zero. And if you don't then have the right levers and mechanisms sitting behind that, then you could end up um, with it being done in an unproductive way that doesn't increase prosperity and wealth and could be very costly um, for the citizens as well. Um, so that's what we're doing. So we've got all of this research that we're looking at, but it is, as I said, in partnership with businesses and policymakers. So we've set up eight regional productivity forums to work with um, regional policymakers and business leaders to identify trends within those regions and involved nations. Um, we have a, a productivity commission that's looking at national policy as well. And it's that collaboration that we're trying to identify um, new ways um, of looking at things. We're, we're undertaking uh, research to, to look at opportunities, threats, and ultimately we want to provide um, the right pathway for, and, and to inform people so that they can make the decision to make the right pathway um, for a productive UK um, so that they don't um, make decisions that could lead to unintended consequences. Um, Thanks very much, Nicola. That's 
very good overview there of our National Productivity Institute. And then again, another great example of partnerships in action. Um, a bit like what I asked Neil then, I was interested if, if, if you were trying to solve this productivity challenge without the role of higher education, without universities at the centre of this, what would be the challenge? I mean, what's the significance of the university sector being involved in such a, a big national and global challenge? I think it's having um, groups of interdisciplinary specialists looking at things at a level that you wouldn't get necessarily from policymakers and business people um, because they're constantly making decisions and they need the evidence and robust evidence um, to help them make informed decisions. And for me, that, that would be the biggest gap if you didn't have research projects like this, um, looking yeah. at such complex issues, because they are complex. Very, very. And you talked a lot about the partnerships then and how they operate across the UK and across our devolved governments, the complexity of this. Imagine the scenario then that the, the universities themselves across the UK, they decided to try and tackle productivity without those other partners. What would be the issue there? What do these other partners bring to the table? Well, they, they make things happen that they put these plans into action. So um, it's why it's vital. I mean, the narrative as well, you know, we're producing research and we're working in partnership. If we don't get that communication right, if we don't get the narrative right, then nothing happens and, and you don't have the desired impact that, that we ultimately want. Um, so it's really, really important to work in partnership and make sure we communicate effectively. And that's two ways as well, because, um, you know, academics need information and insights from those people on the ground, the business leaders and the practitioners and policymakers as well. Uh, so, you know, it, it needs to be a partnership of everyone, all the stakeholders. Thank you. And then I was just interested to finish off, Nicola, in terms of this, this initiative, it is time bound at the moment, but if we imagine this initiative proceeds successfully, what would we be seeing in five years time, do you think, if this was successful, this UK National Productivity Institute? I think um, in much the way that Neil said, you know, that people tell us that our work has had an impact, that they've made decisions based on insights that we've given them, that um, we, we can see evidence that um, when people have been given choices, that they've made the choice that leads to better productivity um, as opposed to other decisions. And, and that, for me, would be a success. Um, that's, a, you know, obviously a higher level, that there are obviously smaller micro wins that you can get along the way but ultimately that's what we want thanks very much nicola so that's a national partnership and i think again it's a really good example of sdg 17 partnerships for the goals this is absolutely where universities are playing a role with other actors whether they're in the the, the state the, the, the third sector um, or the private sector so what we want to do now is move to our third partnership of today and this is a global partnership. So we're zooming from Greater Manchester to the UK, right to the far reaches of the world. And, and, and actually, um, we, we are traveling some considerable distance, but not a considerable time zone, just two hours apart uh, today. And I'm delighted that we've got Bright Amanful joining us. Bright is a master's student in chemical engineering at Stellenbosch University. And Bright is going to be talking about a partnership the university has through the Association of Commonwealth Universities, and in particular, the Queen Elizabeth Scholars Programme. So I'm going to hand over to Bright, first of all, who's going to tell us a bit about who the Association of Commonwealth Universities are and what he's been doing, working in partnership with the University of Manchester and with other master students around the world. So Bright, we're delighted you can join us today. Thanks for joining on the call, and I'll pass over to you now. Thank you, Julian, and thanks to Rachel for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to present on the power of university partnerships to achieve the sustainable development goals. In this presentation, we will briefly explore what the Association of Commonwealth Universities is, what it does and how it relates to the sustainable development goals. The ACU's primary focus is to build a better world through higher education. And constituting the ACU are over 500 universities across the 50 Commonwealth countries. This work network involves more than 10 million students. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. And more than 1 million workers. Aside the individual member universities that constitute the ACU, the ACU collaborates with numerous organizations through strategic partnerships. These partnerships serve as a catalyst for the ACU to achieve large scale and far reaching impact. Higher education is greatly underpinned by research, teaching and community engagement. And these are some of the key driving forces of the SDGs. Since the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are the world's call to action on most of the pressing challenges people and our planet faces, it's therefore only urgent and important that we all approach it through international collaborations or partnerships to result in an all-inclusive and sustainable development. Below are some of the ways which the ACU's work relates or, or tackles the sustainable development goals. International collaboration. In higher education, we get to lead the advancement in knowledge exchange of ideas, enduring bonds between people and institutions on which sustainable development thrives. The SDU through scholarships over the years have created ripples of opportunities that serves people and their communities for which I'm a product of. Through groundbreaking research and results, there's been massive development that is able to solve complex problems in our fields that relates to the 17 SDGs. And for example, COVID vaccine development and production is a testimony of what educational partnerships bring to bear. Thus, the ACU through its work to strengthen universities ensures that universities become the hub of knowledge that provides scalable solutions. Universities become the cornerstone of strong societies and therefore make a vital contribution to societal economical and cultural development of nations. Lastly, I will resume to the partnership between the University of Manchester, for instance, with the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Students were given the detailed understanding of the SDGs. And for some of us from Africa, our lecturers always say, understanding forms part of a critical area of providing solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Bright. That was an excellent overview of the Queen Elizabeth Scholar Programme and what you've been doing. I wanted to ask a few questions, if I may now, Bright, just because um, it's so interesting in your presentation and I think it's another great example of different partnerships uh, to achieve the goals. Uh, I was just interested, first of all, um, what inspired you to join this programme? Because I'm presuming you didn't have to. You've um, chosen to get involved in the Queen Elizabeth scholars program, why, why did you do that? So imagine as a young transformational leader, I've always been intentional to build that aptitude to be at the forefront of leading societal change. Upon reading through the course outline and knowing that this program was facilitated by an institution that is globally recognized to lead the world in making impact as far as the sustainable development goals are concerned, I was so eager to associate with them and the professionals who actually designed the course. I could not wait but want to participate. And even though 2021 was a difficult year because of COVID, I ordinarily could not participate in other capacity building workshops or programs. And being a scholar under the Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Scholarship, um, I remember a time where we engaged our senior program officer to take the program further by engaging scholars and the different intellectual abilities we have. And just a few weeks, this program was introduced. So that gives us confidence that we can play a role in as far as realizing the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals are concerned. Thank you. 
Thanks, Bright. And, and how is working with the University of Manchester and collaborating with all these different students around the world, how, how has that made a difference to the programme? Because I think that's a real feature that you're working with people in lots of different contexts. So what, 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 what's that given you? Okay, so over the past 10 years of my student leadership journey, I've had the opportunity to participate in several workshops and courses in most cases, even though I desire to know the SDGs, looking at the contemporary approach of tackling the SDGs by some of the world leaders, it's made me see the objective of obtaining the 2020, sorry, 2030 objectives of the SDG as fictitious. From all this time, I lived with the deception that it was someone's responsibility until I, wrote, I enrolled in this creating a sustainable development world, 21st century challenges and the SDGs, and I could feel the call for action, the urgent need to join hands. So by engaging with the work of other scholars on the big picture questions and course content on topics like plastics, which was facilitated by Prof Shaver, if I remember right, I have readjusted my focus and uh, beginning to act more than my former approach of knowing more. And now I'm convinced that it's possible. Thank you. Thanks, Bright. And um, we asked the other two speakers where they would envisage if things progress successfully, where their projects would be in five years. But I wanted to ask you a slightly different question. I wanted to know what, what does five years look like for you and what, what does um, the future perhaps even beyond that look like? What will your legacy be? Thank you so much, Julian, for this question. Uh, I look forward to become a waste to energy expert and to lead renewable energy generation on the African continent. And this course was a wake up call for me and, and my former ideas of campaigning on climate drawdown, uh, which I almost abandoned it had it not been for the sake of this program. I look forward therefore to partner with other scholars whom I engaged on the program and researchers in the area of climate change as it requires multiple efforts to tackle. In general, participating in this program has reignited in me a call to action than just talking and just knowing. And one thing about getting involved is that you realize that you can also make an impact and then we can scale whatever ideas we have to solve real life and complex problems our world is facing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bright. We say at Manchester when we when we do our teaching and learning, we really want to create responsible citizens and leaders of tomorrow. And I think everything you've said gives me real hope for our, our role as educators in higher education for that. So thanks for sharing such a, an inspirational story. We really appreciate you giving up your time today for us. So that's our three case studies. What um, we'd like to do now is, is finish with something different perhaps to the three case studies, because we, we're gonna now move on to a call for action to you. If you're watching this, um, you could be watching it live, you could be watching a, a catch up of this. We're interested in uh, reaching out to people beyond the university. And the person I'd like to introduce now who's gonna tell us about this is my colleague, Dr. Jan O'Brien, who's a senior lecturer in geography. Jen, just a quick bit of background, if I may, Jen, um, did a master's and a PhD <laughs> at Manchester, and she's worked here for nearly 12 years now, according to LinkedIn, which I looked at this morning. I think it's 11 years and seven months, Jen. Um, so just remember that. Um, Director of Undergraduate Studies, she is as well in, in geography. She's also an inaugural fellow of our Manchester Institute for Teaching and Learning. She's also a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy, and is also importantly our university's academic lead for sustainability. Mm -hmm. And it was Jen, if you're interested in the course that Bright was talking about, the Queen Elizabeth Scholars Program, it was Jen that was uh, instrumental. She designed this program at Manchester and took it from a, a Manchester based program to being the global program it is now today. But another exciting initiative that Jen has developed is this thing called our Living Labs. And I'm not going to say anything about it because Jen is the expert and the architect behind this and is going to now share with you a call to action. So over to you, please, Jen. Oh, thank you, Julian, so much for the kind introduction. If you just bear with me one moment, because I would like to share some slides with you today. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. 
There we go. Thank you. Um, so as Julian said, this is a call to action, my friends. So if you have been inspired by the partnerships you have heard today, this is your opportunity to get involved yourself. And that opportunity is through our University Living Lab. And let me explain to you a little bit about how Living Labs are, how they work, and particularly how ours works at the University of Manchester. So University Living Labs are not a new concept. They're defined in different ways according to how they're used. But essentially, at their heart, they are all about partnerships, and particularly partnerships between universities and external organisations. Ours is unique, and you can access it through our URL there, but ours is unique in the sense our contribution is the particular partnerships between organisations and our students. And what I argue through this lab is that our students need to undertake assessment as part of their degrees. At the same time, organisations often need research, they need intel to affect change for sustainable development through their work. So why not bring the two together? And indeed, if students are doing assessment anyway, rather than writing yet another essay, why not do something that is useful? So it's almost a circular economy, if you like, bringing together the two needs to affect change together and framed through the United Nations SDGs. And the way that that works is actually really simple and straightforward. So first off, organisations set research uh, that they need. So areas that they need to better understand for their work in sustainable development. And these projects are framed around the SDGs. So students who are undertaking assessment anyway as part of their degree, they can go to this massive database of possible projects, look at something that inspires them, adapt it to their disciplinary perspective and undertake that work as part of their degree program. Students will then submit it as normal to their course, so it'll be marked by their course leader. Uh, and once it's been marked, if a student scores a mark of 65% or over, which is our quality control, they then send it back to our platform and we return that work to the organisation that set it. And all we ask for organisations then is that if they use that research, they share with us the impact that that student research has on the real world, which we can then return to the student to the benefit of their, uh, their, their profile and the course their CV. And we're using the platform to build an open source of knowledge. So we feature many of these reports, more will appear across the next couple of days, actually. And it's a really good way to illustrate or build this open source of knowledge that other organisations can then use um, and adapt. And the impact that we are having is huge. So our impact ranges from students work shaping municipal climate change policies through to our students work on urban health being presented at the Rockefeller Center in New York. But the example that I always use, because I think it's just so true to who we are and what we do, is this one where due to students research, two bubble bee hives were included in a high end sustainable office development in Manchester. They wouldn't have ordinarily factored in uh, beehives. Of course, bees are the keystone of biodiversity. They're a glorious symbol of Manchester. And because of our students research, there will be beehives included within this office block, which I think is just a fantastic way to illustrate the impact that our students have had. And also, if you're an educator listening to this, students love this approach to assessment. So we get incredible student feedback. And the top quote there talks about how students felt that their learning was useful when it was put into a real world context. It's wonderful for students' employability. So we've had two students employed by organisations that they did their research for. So it's a great way for the organisations to talent capture and nurture. And many other students have attributed their employability to this experience. And the bit that I particularly like is it's accessible. This isn't something extra. It's not an additional project. It's part of students' core degree learning. But the other thing that's been really interesting is how this, this partnership approach, and it's something that... Uh, all of my colleagues today have iterated this co-production, this mutual respective work, sorry, res respectful working together has led to a real institutional wide shift in our approach to uh, making a difference. So Manchester Council were one of our um, most supportive partners as this project started. They were kind enough to say that this work and indeed others has led to a real shift in how they see the university as a partner going forward, us working together uh, in mutual benefit for the future. And the scale here is potentially staggering. So just to put this into perspective, we are making huge impact already. There are 40,000 students at the University of Manchester. If just half of them spent a quarter of their time studying in and around sustainable development, we would generate seven and a half million hours a year of time that could be focused on solving these challenges. 
Now, if we scale that up to a global level, factoring in the statistics that HESA suggests uh, the number of uh, students will be in HE in the next, by, I think it's about 2025, we could generate 40 billion hours of research time globally to tackle these problems. And that's my open invitation to you today to join us, to be part of the University Living Lab, to suggest projects if you're an organisation, uh, if you'd like to use the lab as an educator, if you're a student who'd like to adapt some of these projects for your work. I'd be absolutely delighted to share with you our experience so far and to partner together to effect greater change through our University Living Lab. Okay. Oh, I'm just over five minutes, but I'm going to bring that to a close there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. That was a really inspiring way to finish with a call to action. Um, so we will be putting a descriptor of the University Living Lab into our um, uh, into the link with this video. I just wanted to finish by saying, first of all, thanks for joining us today. The SDGs, they're probably the most tangible way in which universities can show their value to society. So I hope today has given you um, a range of opportunities to see how civic partnerships, how national partnerships and global partnerships are key to meeting the SDGs. We want today to be part of an ongoing conversation as well, so I hope you'll be inspired to find out more about our Be Well initiative, our National Productivity Institute, our Queen Elizabeth Scholars Programme with the ACU, and also importantly take up the invitation Jen has just given you to be part of our Living Lab. So you'll get links in the descriptors to all of these things, I wanted to thank Professor Neil Humphreys, I wanted to thank Nicola Pike, I wanted to thank Bright Manful, I wanted to thank Dr. Jen O'Brien, and last but not least, I also wanted to thank Rachel Grunnell, who's in the background in my team today for organizing today's session. Higher education, working in these mutually beneficial partnerships with others. Hopefully you've seen today some really good examples of how we can address the SDGs together. So please feel free to get in touch with the University of Manchester if you want to work with us in meeting the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much.